Good evening and welcome to tonight's CME activity. There is no commercial support. The speakers and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after tonight's activity. If you're viewing online, I'll list the link into the chat section. And if you're viewing this after the fact, you will find the evaluation link in the description section of the video. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Delzell. I'd like to welcome you. My name is uh, Dr. John Delzell. I'm Vice President for Medical Education here at Northeast Georgia Health System, and I serve as the DIO for Northeast Georgia Medical Center. And uh, on behalf of our entire uh, GME program and all of my colleagues in the residency programs, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for being here tonight for the fifth annual Henry S. Jennings Visiting Lectureship in Medical Humanities. Whether you're here in Walters or joining us virtually, thank you for your interest and for your support. First, I wanna say that this lecture series would not be possible if it wasn't for the generous signature gift to Northeast Georgia Health System Foundation from the Dr. Jennings family. Their gift honors Dr. Henry S. Jennings, one of the healthcare pioneers here in Gainesville and one of the earliest physicians at Hall County Hospital. Please, Jennings family, would you stand up? We're back here. We also have uh, members of the Jennings family that are online and we just wanna thank them for their generosity and for this uh, very impactful gift that they've given. I'd also like to thank our board members and senior leadership for their continued support of the Graduate Medical Education Program. I know I saw some of you here. If you could stand up and be recognized. Thank you so much. Tonight, I'm really excited to welcome our featured speaker, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, who's president of the American Medical Association. Just let that sink in for a second. Right here in little old Gainesville, we have the president of the AMA. I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Ehrenfeld's amazing accomplishments. So he is a senior associate dean, tenured professor of anesthesiology, and director of the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Ehrenfeld divides his time between clinical practice, teaching, research, and he directs a $560 million statewide health philanthropy. So it makes me feel like I'm kind of a slug. I'm not quite doing enough right now, so I need to pick it up. Dr. Ehrenfeld was elected to the American Medical Association's Board of Trustees in 2014. He became president-elect of the AMA in June of 2022. If that wasn't enough, he also has an appointment as an adjunct professor of anesthesiology and health policy at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and an adjunct professor of surgery at the Uniformed Services University in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, Maryland. Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Ehrenfeld is a consultant to the WHO's Digital Health Technical Advisory Group, and he previously served as co-chair of the Navy Surgeon General's Task Force on personalized and digital medicine, and as a special advisor to the 20th U.S. Surgeon General. Tonight, Dr. Ehrenfeld is gonna present a talk, The Potential, Promises, and Pitfalls of AI in Medicine. I'm very excited about that because I'm scared of AI all the time, so I'm hoping that he's going to reassure me that it's not gonna take over the world. Or maybe not, we'll see. Please. Help me welcome Dr. Ehrenfeld to the podium for what's going to be an amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this lovely invitation to spend the evening with you to talk about a subject that I know is on the minds of many, um, which is AI and, and digital medicine. Um, I am Jesse Ehrenfeld. I am the president of the AMA. Um, and it really is such an honor to deliver the Jennings Lecture, um, which of course celebrates the career of Dr. Henry Jennings, a true leader in medicine and a, a public health champion. I, I did not ever know um, Dr. Henry Jennings, but I know his son, Hank, pretty well. 
Um, and he and I overlapped at Vanderbilt for about nine, 10 years um, and got to work um, pretty closely uh, in medical education. Um, and it's clear from what I've learned about Hank's dad, Dr. Henry Jennings, um, that the legacy of service and commitment to the profession uh, is an enduring trait uh, across the family. And I look forward to meeting his sister uh, uh, and family tonight as well. So, you know, it's kind of fun if you step back and, and ponder, you know, what a pioneer like Dr. Jennings would make of the current state of our healthcare system. Um, I wonder what he would think about digital health in AI and its impact on the humanity of the patient-physician relationship. Um, how would he get the most out of these exciting new technologies for the betterment of his patients and his community here in Georgia? There's so much happening across healthcare now and I see it every day because I am out on the road a lot talking with physicians and lawmakers and legislators um, there's a lot that demands our attention as physicians. And just about everywhere I go, I'm asked about AI. Um, where is science? Where is medicine going? And it's an important question to ask ourselves as physicians um, because digital technology is rapidly changing the healthcare environment, not just for patients, but for physicians fundamentally. And the future of medicine is an exciting one. Um, technologies like AI and AI-enabled tools have enormous potential, enormous potential to change how we care for our patients to improve patient outcomes. But we've also heard these kind of claims before um, about other technologies. And a lot of us are still pretty scarred from our frustrations with the advent of electronic health records, which were gonna make everything better, faster, cheaper. Uh, and look what that looked like when we had poorly designed tools that often failed to deliver on their promise. So that you know, brings us to uncertainty and unease in conversations about AI, which I'm gonna get into in my comments tonight. Um, at the end of the day, what good is a new technology, even a revolutionary technology like AI, if it's not trusted by physicians, if it's not trusted by patients that we serve? What good is it if it's just another burden placed on our shoulders as we're trying to get through our day delivering the care that our patients so desperately need? So I'm gonna highlight um, how physicians view AI, but also provide a roadmap for creation of these tools how they can be used in healthcare, what do we need developers to do, what does the regulatory environment and framework need to be to make this successful for everybody involved, and we should have some time at the end to uh, do a little bit of, of question and answer. So I have no relevant disclosures uh, related to my talk tonight. I do sit on some advisory boards and do some consulting, and obviously uh, get some support from the AMA for my travels uh, in life. The um, objectives for my talk this evening are to talk about the health trends, what's weighing on the minds of physicians, highlight how the AMA is supporting physicians through the design and deployment of technologies like AI, and talk about what role the AMA and physicians leaders need to have in driving that future. So, um, this is my 96 or so page CV on a slide, and I appreciate the very lovely introduction. Um, the only takeaway point that's relevant here is that a lot of my research background and training and education has been in clinical informatics. And so I'm board certified in both anesthesiology. I saw nine patients in the OR yesterday before I made my way down here. Uh, and uh, clinical informatics. And I spent uh, nearly 15 years developing AI tools, clinical decision support, thinking about how we can do implementations that work for patients. Um, and along the way, got very heavily involved in standards because standards are so important to create the framework for technologies to be implemented. Um, and all of this, of course, is centered on my work as a clinician. And this is a, this is a picture I, I took in the operating room in Milwaukee, where I, I happen to work now, um, a few months back. And it reminds me that the technologies 
are really all about the patients that, that we serve. So sometimes I like to begin presentations by asking physicians in the room to think of a single word, a single word that sums up how do you feel about the current state of our healthcare system? A single word that describes how you experience it as a physician. And what often comes to mind are words like frustrated, powerless, feelings that quickly lead to burnout if solutions aren't found quickly. And our last survey from the AMA on burnout found that about two in three physicians are experiencing symptoms of burnout throughout the pandemic, which isn't surprising considering the extraordinary pressure that all of us found ourselves working under. And we know that burnout reflects health system challenges, not challenges necessarily that the individual experiences and can fix, but challenges that are happening at the system level, which is where the solutions need to be faced. What's weighing on people's minds today? Well, we have an expanding administrative bureaucracy, endless paperwork, increasing hostility, threats of violence online and in real life, continuing challenges around misinformation and its impact on patients accepting and receiving the care that they need, deliberate attacks on evidence-based medicine and the practice of science-based medicine, government interference into the patient-physician relationship and decision-making, a surging burden of chronic disease. In most states, half of adults have hypertension and only half of those adults have it under control. We continue to face economic uncertainty, rising inflation and a lot of pressure around geoglobal politics, a lack of trust in medical institutions, unfortunately, trust in science, trust in the profession, trust in the CDC and the FDA all continue to erode rising professional burnouts, workforce shortages, and of course, all of these questions about AI and what does it mean when I walk into an exam room or an operating room to take care of a patient. So the AMA works to represent physicians with a unified voice in all of our activities can really be grouped into three buckets, removing the things that get in the way of taking care of patients, leading the charge to confront public health crises, chronic disease, and driving and reimagining the future of medicine. How is the AMA driving the future? Well, it's clear to me that we all see the promise of AI. I think everybody here understands that we are entering, we have entered, we are living in an AI era. We just don't really understand what that means. So let me tell you a story about my son that's very personal. Um, this is my older son, Ethan, and he was born at 29 weeks. That is the very first picture I snapped of him as he was being rushed from the delivery suite into the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, he was born just over 1,100 grams, and he spent 49 days in the ICU where he benefited from a whole variety of technology and standards that kept him alive. Things that we take for granted, things that just work, like pulse oximetry and continuous infusion pumps and warm air incubators, things that, however, didn't always work. And uh, in the 50s, there was a very famous surgeon named Joel Nobel uh, who founded the ECRI Institute. They still exist outside of uh, Philadelphia. He was a surgeon and, and an, an inventor, and um, he was really shocked when an infant died in his arms because the incubator overheated because of a thermostat malfunction. And there was a series of deaths of infants in incubators from thermostat malfunctions uh, infants that were electrocuted because of wiring problems. Um, and he ushered in an era of comparative evaluation of medical device technologies 
that opened an era of standards for medical devices that brought in FDA regulatory oversight for a lot of these tools and technologies that we take for granted today. Now, fortunately, Ethan's incubator did not overheat. It did not shock him. He is just fine. Uh, the picture on the left was New Year's Day as we were flying to our family vacation in the islands. Uh, and you can tell that he is four by the words he is spelling in Scrabble, and I'll let you just uh, figure out the rest. When I think about AI and how we could potentially implement it in practice, and I'll, I'll show you the data and what it looks like in a minute, there's a really important lesson that we have to learn from another industry, and that is the airline industry. So, um, now, Boeing's having a lot of problems lately. Um, but if you think back to three years ago, uh, they lost tragically two 737 MAX uh, airliners um, because of an AI safety system that caused a problem. Um, and I'll, I'll get technical here for a second. So um, on these new 737 MAXs, the engines are bigger. Um, and so if you mount the engines where they normally would be on a regular 737, they would risk dragging on the ground. So Boeing fixed this problem by mounting them further up on the wing. The problem is um, that creates uh, actually more lift. And more lift causes the plane's nose to go up during normal flight. Um, so Boeing said, no problem. We'll build in an AI safety control system. So if the plane's fly normally and a sensor detects that the nose is going up, it just gently pushes the nose back down to level the plane out. Um, unfortunately, there was a series of sensor malfunctions and that AI safety system, when these two planes were flying normally, thought that the nose was going up and it pushed the nose into the ground and those aircraft and all of the passengers were lost. The shocking thing about this is that the pilots of those doomed aircraft had no awareness, zero awareness of this new AI safety control system. It was not in the operations manuals. There was no specific training provided to those flight crew. We simply cannot make that same mistake in healthcare lest our patients be harmed and we have no idea how to supervise and correct and control systems that are under our watch. You know, I showed you a picture of, you know, me in the operating room or my equipment. Imagine me walking into an operating room, turning on a ventilator and the ventilator is using some AI control system to try to wean a patient's respiratory parameters, but I don't know what's happening. How on earth can I supervise and correct and intervene if there's a problem if I don't know that the ventilator is doing something, even if you can't figure out exactly what it's doing because of deep learning and other uh, machine learning approaches. So, you know, AI is not new. The concept has been around for a long time. Um, this is a graphic that of course now is sort of hopelessly out of date, but it shows some of the milestones. What I will tell you is that we are at the peak of inflated expectations, right? Everybody expects AI to make them smarter, sexier, more wealthy, uh, and solve all of the world's problems. Um, there will be a trough of disillusionment, and this is the Gartner hype curve. Um, this has been shown to basically mirror the adoption of any technology. Um, and so when the AMA talks about AI, um, we are intentional um, and actually using a slightly different phrase. We like the phrase, augmented intelligence, because artificial intelligence, we actually don't think should be the goal. The goal ought to be to augment the capacity of our healthcare teams, to boost the capacity of our clinicians, to make them more effective, increase their ability to care for their patients, but not replace them. So when we ask um, physicians across the country, what do you need to adopt and acquire and start using a new technology, whether it's AI related or not, there are four questions that come up repeatedly. And the four questions are, does the thing work? And this should be an obvious question to answer, right? Today, if there's a new medication um, like Ozempic or something else, you know, I could read the package insert. There's clinical data, trials that were submitted 
that I can understand who the patients were enrolled in the study. Do those patients actually look at my, like the patients that I see? Um, but for AI algorithms, this becomes more challenging. Um, because it's not clear what level of evidence we should require or from a regulatory standpoint will require before a product is brought into the market. So it becomes more challenging. The second issue is payment. If I'm going to buy a technology or implement a technology, how do I get reimbursed for the acquisition costs? The third question is, will I be liable? And this is a tricky one. Um, there is, uh, I will just call it, a boneheaded federal proposal right now. Um, it hasn't been finalized. It's been sitting out there for two years. That basically says if a clinician, a physician, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant uses an algorithm to make a clinical decision and something goes wrong with the patient, even if it's the algorithm's fault, the liability solely lies with the clinician, the end user. We don't think that makes sense. We think that will stifle innovation and end markets because who's going to buy a technology if you can't be sure that it works and if something goes wrong and it was really the developer's fault or the implementer's problem or the electronic health record interface to place the blame solely on the clinician probably just doesn't make sense. So that issue of liability is really important. And then finally, does it actually work in my practice? And I will admit it, I have made this mistake. I, um, once upon a time, Develop some technology, some decision support, an algorithm in our adult hospital. And I naively made a mistake that I should have known better because in medical school, it was drilled into me over and over um, that children are not small adults. And you cannot just take technology from an adult hospital and drop it into a pediatric hospital and expect that it's going to work because the workflows are different. Um, the uh, physiology is different. Everything is different. Um, and I naively made that mistake. I learned an important lesson. Um, but this issue of transferability, do these things actually work in my practice? If something you know, was developed in New York City and you bring it down here to Gainesville, Georgia, um, what are the odds that it's actually going to work on your patients with your workflows, with your practice? That's a really, really critically important question. Now, we did a survey, a nationally representative survey of physicians in August of this past year. We released these results in the fall. And it really gets at how do physicians view the potential of AI? And, um, you know, in the introductory comments, you know, the um, mention about being a little bit afraid of what AI is going to mean, um, that's actually pretty common. 41% of U.S. physicians say they are equally excited as they are terrified of AI and what it's going to mean for the practice of medicine. There's a lot of enthusiasm. People see promise in these tools to help us be better diagnosticians, to support workflow efficiencies, to make the billing office uh, get off our back a little bit more. Um, but a lot of concern about the impact on the humanity of our patient-physician relationship, concerns about privacy and where data is going and who has access to it. Um, more than 90% of physicians nationally say that they want information about the AI so they can help them understand how is it getting to a decision? Where did the information come from? Is there bias baked into the decisions that are being promulgated? Now, the AMA thinks a lot about how do we influence innovation to achieve those goals, and we've got lots of resources to try to guide and influence and shape um, how uh, these technologies are brought forward. Um, and one of the places that we spend a lot of time is thinking about the regulatory framework. And there is significant uncertainty about what the regulatory framework for regulated products out of the FDA is going to look like. Um, it's clear to me that the system that the FDA has set up by the Food and Drug Cosmetics Act and Medicines Act in the 60s um, is just not very well suited to regulating digital tools in medicine and AI. Um, we need a new approach. We need a new framework. But it's really important that whatever Congress and the FDA decide to do, we ensure that we only have safe, effective, high-quality products hitting the marketplace. We need to make sure that AI doesn't introduce bias into its results. And uh, the FDA actually launched a pilot program about three years ago called a software pre-certification program. And 
And rather than having regulatory review of the software and the outputs and the products and clinical trials data, they basically said, okay, we're going to look at the developer. And if the developer, you know, they adhere to best software practices and they, they didn't steal their data off the internet and they, you know, check all of these boxes, um, that they can actually bring any product they want into the marketplace. Similar to what they do with manufacturing facilities. They look at the facility and its processes, not the actual end output of the factory. Um, and so nine companies went through that program. They brought products into the marketplace. Uh, and the FDA is signaling that they would like to expand that and make that the way that AI-enabled software as a medical device is brought into the marketplace. We have a lot of concerns about that. Um, they probably don't have the regulatory authority to do without Congress um, stepping in, uh, but making sure that we have a framework that puts safety first, uh, clinically validated AI is, is really, really important. We know that um, if we're not very intentional, um, we will repeat some of the problems that we've seen with other technologies um, like the pulse ox. And I was at an FDA hearing last week on this, this topic. Many of you probably are aware that it was well described during the pandemic by a team out of the University of Michigan that pulse oximetry, which is really important, I would never take a patient to the operating room without a pulse ox, um, has a calibration problem. And it overestimates oxygen saturation in patients with dark skin tones. And so during COVID, this was well described at creating triage problems. Um, black patients in Michigan were not getting supplemental oxygen, were not being put in the ICU because of pulse oximetry calibration problems. And the shocking thing isn't so much the calibration problem, the shocking thing is that we've known about this for 30 years. It's in the literature, it's well described. There's never been an urgency to fix this problem, to make sure that the technology actually works for all patients in all communities until today. If we are not very intentional and very explicit in making sure that AI algorithms that will often be hidden in the background of software or devices that we're using, if we're not very intentional about ensuring that bias doesn't get introduced, this will happen over and over and over and will insidiously harm thousands, if not millions of patients across the globe. So we have to be very careful. The AMA is working very hard to think about how do we make sure that we don't allow bias to creep into digital health tools. We have something called our In Full Health Initiative. Uh, there's a blueprint that's available online, but basically it's, it's geared at making sure that we understand how does racism, sexism, and other bias impact health innovation? How do we invest in health innovations from and for historically marginalized communities? And how do we make sure that we engage the industry to, to get this right? We have an external equity and innovation advisory group and they are committed to helping us make sure that we have equitable opportunities for health innovation. I think about tools like this, and uh, this is a little graphic I stole off the internet, but it's out there, you can find it. Um, this is uh, Google's AI-powered dermatology tools. It's not available in the US, it's available in Europe. And what they say on their website is that based on the photos and information you provide, our AI-powered dermatology assist tool will offer suggested conditions, and it's marked as a CE class one medical device in the EU. Not available in the US, but I have a call actually with the team at Google that um, has created this in a few weeks to talk about their plans here uh, in the US. How do we talk to our patients about a tool like this? What happens when the algorithm changes, and I use it on Monday, but I would have gotten a different answer if I used it a week later. How do we think about incorporating this into practice? What information do we need to know? And what do you do when something goes wrong with a tool like this? How on earth do you call Google? Um, you know, I, I was at the dermatologist last week and um, I spent some time in the sun as a young boy at the beach. I was trash boy and then desk clerk and then pool boy, all the things at a pretty cheap roadside motel. And um, I've got some freckles and moles and skin things. Um, 
And, uh, you know, there's a spot or two that are a little concerning. And my dermatologist said, you know, let me, let me take a look. And uh, there's one that, you know, she was worried about, worried enough about to do a biopsy and, and uh, make sure they got good margins. And, um, you know, the most important thing that she did wasn't actually, you know, taking out this lesion that turned out to be benign, got a call today. The most important thing she did was put her hand on her shoulder, on my shoulder, and, and reassure me um, about, you know, in her 30 years of expertise, this is what she thought was going on and, and what it meant. How do we think about that interface when we have technologies that suddenly are either augmenting or changing the interface between a patient and a physician? So the AMA um, has been working on principles for AI use and development and integration of practice for a number of years. Um, we initially released policy in 2018, and this past November, we updated those policies. You can find them uh, at the QR code or on our, on our website. Um, there's a lot in those um, policies. They, they talk about making sure that we have the right regulatory framework. And um, uh, above all else, though, they really describe how we need to have AI designed developed and deployed in a way that is ethical, equitable, responsible, and transparent. And those AI principles really emphasize human-centered care, and they emphasize that it's critical that we always have a human in the loop who's able to supervise and correct issues when they rise up. And as the potential for harm to a patient increases, the ability for that human to step in needs to happen earlier and earlier in the process. And we have to make sure that we, of course, bring these tools into our clinics and our workplaces in a way that actually harmonizes with how we deliver care and doesn't add additional burden. And the way that I really like to think about these tools is that it should be not technology versus the human, it should be technology plus the human, together where you can boost the capability of both. And um, Dr. Abraham Verghese, who I've gotten to do a little bit of work with, this was a picture I took in Florida uh, last month. Some of you may know him. He's written an incredible number of books. Cutting for Stone was his first uh, bestseller, um, and he's released several more. Um, he said the way to think here is not technology versus human, but ask how they come together where the sum can be greater than the parts for an equitable, inclusive, human and humane care and practice in medicine. And I could not speak better words um, about this topic than what he has said. Of course, it's critical that we earn and keep the trust of our patients. And we all know that the FDA and the CDC are in a bit of a tough spot right now. They have lost a lot of that credibility and trust. They're working hard to restore it. Um, but understanding how we make sure that we have a regulatory framework that doesn't allow digital snake oil to flood the marketplace and harm patients is a key important piece of this. It's not clear to me what role you know, the Consumer Product Safety Commission will have. There's going to be a whole slew of unregulated products that don't meet the definition of a medical device the consumers will use, like that Google Germ product, what role they have is unclear. Um, I think there's going to be an increased emphasis on post-market surveillance, understanding what's happening to patients as these tools are used in our practices, but we don't really have the great, greatest infrastructure to support that need today. It's going to have to be developed. I do think there'll be things that companies are required to do under whatever regulatory framework we have. And then there'll be the things that companies do that goes above and beyond that. And that's where I think there'll be an opportunity for individual companies, entrepreneurs to really differentiate themselves um, and lead in, in the marketplace, doing things that they may not have to, but because they're the right thing to do for our patients and to earn that trust. And of course, just as important as patient trust is, is physician trust. And we need to make sure that lawmakers give us clear, consistent regulatory framework and guidance. We need to figure out how we're going to pay for these things as they're developed and brought into our practices. We need to solve that liability question about what is the right level of exposure when you're using a product. 
and it's probably should be shared and not solely limited to the end user. And of course, we have to work together to build that trust. So to wrap up, um, I think that all of these tools will clearly transform how we work. We need that. It shouldn't be thought of as the human versus the machine. The sum is truly greater than the parts. There is tremendous potential to scale capacity and we need this desperately. Um, you know, we just do not have, we will not have the healthcare workforce that we need to take care of all of the patients in America, let alone worldwide, without leaning into these technologies. And I'll, I'll give a quick example as an aside to help you see this issue of capacity and scaling and what's possible. The first autonomous FDA AI approved device is in the diabetic retinopathy space. And as I'm sure most of you know, if you are a diabetic patient, the screening guidelines are you should get an annual eye exam to look for diabetic retinopathy because obviously that can lead to blindness, which is a devastating complication of diabetes. But most patients in America who have diabetes don't get an annual eye exam. There are lots of reasons for that. There are economic barriers, access issues, but there's also just the sad reality that we don't have enough people to do those diabetic retinopathy eye exams. We never will. There are too many patients with diabetes. But there is now a device, it's about you know, the size of a small microwave, um, that you can put a patient in front of and somebody with a high school education can operate it. You can put them in a retail pharmacy, you can put them in a primary care clinic, you can put it pretty much anywhere. And it takes pictures of the retinas. And it uses image recognition, AI, technologies, and the company is so confident in the accuracy of this device that they carry liability insurance on their product. Now suddenly you can screen, theoretically, every diabetic patient as often as you want because these machines are pretty cheap to manufacture and they never take vacation, they never go uh, to sleep. Um, and then it means that the work of the ophthalmologist changes. No longer do they need to do these annual normal screening exams. Suddenly they can only see the patient with the disease. And it opens up an opportunity to reconfigure and change our workflows to scale the capacity of the people that we have and so desperately need to hold on to in our workforce. So I think there is tremendous potential to scale the capacity of our teams if we implement these technologies in a way that works for patients uh, and our practices. Uh, and finally, my last comment, AI won't replace physicians, but I do think that physicians who use AI will someday replace those who do. So I hope you can all help us at the AMA create a better future for our patients. Um, for those of you in the audience who happen to be members, thank you. Uh, for anybody who's interested in becoming a member, I'd be happy to talk to you at any point afterwards. Um, at the end of the day, you know, this is about our patients and our families. And I'll close with an adorable picture of my children, uh, Ethan on the left and Asher on the right, who just turned a year old. And I'd be happy uh, after I think there's some closing comments to do some Q&A. Thank you. Very much. My pleasure. Dr. Aaronfield, thank you very much for joining us here today on, on behalf of the health system and GME. I want to thank you for taking time, energy, and effort to come here and share your wisdom of uh, augmented intelligence with us today. You got it. Uh, it's exciting and it's kind of scary as well. Um, but we look forward to learning more about that. Again, you being here shows your commitment to passion and passion and excellence to spreading education to physicians in the community across the country. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I'm Dr. Pepper Brown. I'm the chairman of the Health System Foundation. Uh, and it is through the foundation and the generous gift of, um, <clears throat> of Hank and Polly Jennings, who are joining us virtually in Nashville now, and through David and Betsy Powell, um, Jennings Powell, rather, who are here this evening as well. Thank you so much for the for the lead gift you gave to, to fund this lectureship, this named lectureship, 
in honor of Dr. Jennings. <clears throat> Take a moment. On the back of your program, you have a, a bio of Dr. Jennings. I had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Jennings all of my life, actually. He's a friend of my family, my father, this health system. He was a gentleman. He was a consummate physician. He was a consummate gentleman physician. And it's often said, and you alluded to this earlier, what Dr. Jennings would think of AI now. And I think about that now. We, it's often said that we stand, we see so far because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Dr. Jennings certainly was one of the giant shoulders we stood upon and has gotten us to where we are today in this health system. So again, thank you for being here today. A um, couple of housekeeping things. and We have a reception. Uh, following this lectureship here, please join us for that. And secondly, Dr. Aaron Field has agreed to answer questions uh, from staff, uh, residents, or community as well. So with that, we will be adjourned here today. Thank you, Dr. Aaron Field. Thank you, Dr. Aaron Field. We do have a comment online. If you do have a question, if you'll raise your hand. Uh, for the recording, we'll need to um, use the microphones. So, um, oh my, Jesse, what a great choice you were by the selection committee for this lecture named for Dad. He would have loved this presentation. Great leadership for the AMA, all of us by you. Enjoyed phone chat last night. Safe travels back tomorrow. And that's from Hank. We do have a question online uh, from uh, Dr. Kruer. What's the most immediate likelihood of AI assisting in documentation burden? Great question. So um, I didn't mention that in our uh, AI survey work, um, about 40% of U.S. practices and healthcare systems are using AI today. Um, it's mostly for the unsexy stuff. It's back-end office operations, supply chain management, scheduling, some of the billing and finance things. Um, but the one place that I've seen it really uh, be incredibly impactful in a somewhat universal way is actually uh, in exactly that spot around no creation. Um, there, there are probably 30 companies now. There's, there's one that's publicly traded. They've been around for a while um, in the ambient dictation space. So, you know, they've got a little device, it goes in your exam room, um, and you can walk out uh, and without having to touch the computer, look at the keyboard, you can actually sit down and have a conversation with your patient, and your note is created automatically, uploaded into the EMR, and you can verify and conclude uh, afterwards. Um, I have a um, awareness of, uh, of one uh, physician in particular who, who got one of these products, um, and she started crying because for the first time in six months, she actually got home in time to have dinner with her kids. And um, when you think about um, the impact of these technologies to radically change our workflow and get us back to the things that we went into the profession to do, which is to look at our patients and touch them on the shoulder and reassure them and not be so tethered to our keyboards and our computers, um, certainly, the ambient dictation uh, approach is, I think, uh, going to be a, a real uh, opportunity for, for benefit. So, great question. Thank you, Dr. Ehrenfeld, for an outstanding talk and a lot, lot of information. Curious about your practice. Um, we do a lot of robotic surgeries here in, in Gainesville. And just curious, you know, within your practice or in the OR setting, are there AI tools that you're, you yourself are already using or trialing, or where do you see the biggest impact in, in surgery? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, certainly, um, all of the robotic surgery companies uh, are trying to figure this out, um, how they can use AI uh, in their tools to make them more effective. Um, and I'm aware of some of those trials that we're you know, doing at, uh, at uh, MCW where I, where I happen to work. Um, it's interesting, the, the only actual tool that, that I personally use um, is an AI-enabled stethoscope, um, and there's some features in our electronic health record to deal with in-basket messages that um, basically allow some triage capabilities to happen. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest in large language models and what those will mean. What I, I will, I'll ruin the surprise for you, though. Um, so... If you want to just be horribly disappointed with, you know, chat GPT, ask it to do math. 
um, because that's not what it's built to do. Um, if you ask it, you know, tell me 12 times 23, you'll get the wrong answer um, because it's not a math tool. Um, it's a tool that is using its corpus of words to predict the next word, the next sentence, the next paragraph. So if, if you ask it to do math, you're using the wrong tool for the wrong solution. Um, and as soon as you understand what these tools do and what they're really good at, then you can see that, oh, there's a place for chat. There's a place for patient engagement where large language models can be really, really helpful, um, but not trying to do clinical reasoning because that's not actually what they're designed to do. Great question. Dr. Dr. Ehrenfeld, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I, you know, I live in the education space for a lot of my life, and I'm uh, thinking about how how this eventually really starts to impact undergraduate medical education. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about the the fire hose of information that we um, force onto medical students, and and uh, you know, where where do you see um, you know augmented intelligence and sort of all the things that are happening out in that space and clinical decision making and that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, how that uh, may impact our medical education processes? Great question. So uh, it's clear to me that AI. Um, will change education in lots of different kinds of ways. Um, the AMA through our innovation work is thinking deep about what precision education means um, and what it could look like um, as we try to customize the journey and move towards a more competency-based framework for training education. Um, now, you know, the whole idea of a competency-based framework, you know, it, it's not novel. It's been described for at least two decades now, um, but it's really challenging to do without a lot of data to drive the decisions about where a learner needs to um, develop skills and competencies. Um, so there are a couple of interesting pilots that are going on right now, um, basically squarely aimed in that space at the, the UNU level. I'm happy to share some information offline. Um, the other place that's very interesting um, is in the, the GME and continuous professional development space. And so uh, the AMA has a pilot going on right now um, called Reconnect. Um, and this concept is not hard to understand. Um, you know, uh, for a lot of clinicians, you can predict uh, the things that they might see because you know their schedule in advance. Now that doesn't work for everybody, um, but for a lot of clinicians it does. Um, and so there's a product that's in beta right now that basically looks at uh, patients that are going to appear in front of a clinician within the next week. It looks for conditions, it looks for things in their notes, it looks for past history, it looks for odd things that a clinician may not have seen in a while. Um, and then it serves up very targeted on-demand information. And a 10-minute, twice-a-week interaction with this tool um, led to, on average, I think, five clinical decisions changing in a pilot group of uh, practicing physicians. So you can imagine how tools that can help us know where to look for information, that can provide information in real time on demand, uh, particularly can be powerful um, uh, as we're thinking about um, filling in those educational gaps. Great question. I have a couple of questions online. First one is, what about AI monitoring for system failures? Yes. Um, wouldn't it be great to know that, you know, the car was going to break down before you get in it and it doesn't turn on? Um, there are some interesting uh, companies uh, working in that space to try to look for um, system failures. Um, the place that probably is going to have, I think, the most immediate impact is in cybersecurity. And I will be honest, um, if you're like my organization, uh, even if you have a really bright CMIO and CIO, um, nobody really knows what to do with cybersecurity, right? Um, you've seen the ransomware attacks and all sorts of challenges. There are companies that are using data and AI tools to proactively sense when there are strange access patterns happening across networks and electronic health records um, that have been able to, at least uh, in some pilot work, demonstrate uh, problems much, much more quickly than could otherwise be detected. And so that's a pretty narrow use case in cybersecurity for your healthcare systems network. But you can imagine expanding that to um, other parts of the healthcare system or even the human body in ways that um, suddenly don't seem so far-fetched. 
Excellent. And how can AI assist in alert fatigue and monitoring in places like ICUs, population health at home, and so forth? Yeah, so, um, you know, there, there are definitely tools um, that can help us theoretically recognize when somebody is fatigued. Um, but, but I think the, the more uh, impactful opportunity is to reduce the burden on our existing workforce. And, you know, there's so many things uh, like prior authorization requests um, that are just frustrating, take a ton of time that could be automated that aren't. Um, and I will, I will point out uh, anecdotally, this isn't really an, an AI thing, but um, the AMA um, on your behalf had a huge win two weeks ago. Um, a final rule out of CMS that's going to require automatically integrated prior auth, directly integrated with electronic health records for anything that CMS touches, Medicare, Medicaid, children's health plans, anything sold on the exchange, it's going to move the market. So rather than having to fax forms or sign on to a particular provider's portal to upload information, um, that will, uh, in 2026 and 2027, be required by federal rule to be automated with electronic health records. So um, anything that we can do using AI tools or digital workflows to reduce the burden on our day-to-day -day practices is obviously going to be so important to reducing burnout uh, and fatigue. Excellent. I don't see any other questions online. Any other questions or comments in the room? Oh, here we go. Hey, thank you so much. Just quick question. Um, how far behind do you think we are with respect to policy and legislation um, when it comes to implementing some of these tools? Or are we behind at all? You know, there are differing opinions on that. Um, I was uh, briefing about 20 Congress people behind closed doors last week in Washington um, who are struggling with that exact question. Um, and, you know, the, the administration put out an executive order that basically described a whole of government approach to figuring out what we need to do in this space. I think that executive order, um, which doesn't really have teeth in it because we, we need legislation and regulation, um, was really designed to reassure the public that, you know, the government's got this and, and is going to make sense of this. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure um, that we are where we need to be. Um, it's clear that we need some regulatory framework that makes sense for, for us in healthcare, but I think there are larger societal questions that are still uh, above my pay grade to figure out. I will just close by saying that there, there are definitely things that AI tools should be able to help us with, that we should build and figure out and embrace. And then there are other things that we should just never ask AI to do. Um, and that includes, you know, figuring out when to launch a nuclear warhead. And what? Thank you all so much for having me. Actually, you know, if if I might, if I could ask the Jennings family to join me for a moment. Um, <clears throat> I spent ten years in the uh, military. I was in Afghanistan in 2014, 2015. Did a lot of strategy work for the Navy, Navy Surgeon General. And uh, there's a particular tradition uh, in the military. And uh, I have something for these kind folks. I wanted to present both of you with my presidential challenge coin. Uh, which is a military tradition that goes back um, a couple hundred years. Uh, thank you so Thanks. much for everything that you're doing for this community. And for having us. Thank you so much.